Let me get back to prayer. We've been talking about prayer on Wednesday. And this is where I left off this past Wednesday night. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war within your members? You lust and do not have. You murder, covet, and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. In other words, he said you can war, you can fight, you can have desire, you can lust, you can murder, you can covet, and you still won't obtain. Why? Because there's some things that you only get by asking. You can't work it into your life. You can't covet it into your life. You can't wish it into your life. You can't stomp on and cheat everybody else to get to it. There's some things that God holds it and it'll only come to you by you just asking. And he says, you have not because you ask not. You say, well, that don't really apply to me. I know that verse. I learned that verse when I was a kid. Well, when you get a headache, do you go to aspirin first or to God? Let me go further and say something. There's nobody more grateful for conveniences than me. My life is very busy. If I find anything that will help me out, I'll use it. I need modern conveniences. I'm grateful for it. Don't misinterpret me. But there are a lot of times that our modern conveniences rob us of opportunities to believe God. There's sometimes where God just wants you to believe Him for that money, but you got a credit card. And because that credit, I know I, I do this, and I start go, ooh, hey, ooh, you know. <laughs> There's sometimes God just wants you to believe Him for that, okay? He wants you to believe Him for that money, for that set of tires. He knows it's five, six hundred bucks. Believe Him for, but it's so convenient to pull that credit card out and pay twenty-two percent interest, okay? You could have bought somebody to drive you by the time you pay off them tires. You'll pay for them seven times. Do you see what I'm talking about? And conveniences, you know, there are many times I catch myself, I am running, 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 start getting a little headache, and all of a sudden I'll pop to Excedrin, and God go the whole day, and I ain't even stop and ask. God, I thank you that your stripes also didn't just heal cancer, it healed headaches. And I thank you, God, that this headache will not rule over my life today. You know, just little things like that. So James is addressing this issue of asking. Okay? Not being, not being a beggar, but approaching God with the need that you have. Now let me go right, right here a little bit further. Y'all alright? You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. In other words, you, you ask with wrong motive. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be the friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealousy, jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now here's where I ended last week. God set the rules of how things would work in the earth in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 when he said, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. When God said, let them have dominion, when a king decrees something, it cannot be overturned. Okay? The king, King Darius, decreed that anybody who would not bow would be thrown into the lion's den. His best friend Daniel was one of the people that didn't bow. And then when he found out that Daniel was going to be thrown into the lion's den, he could not even overturn his own word. He had spoken it, it had to come to pass. So what did God do? He shut the lion's mouth and brought Daniel through the lion's den and wouldn't allow the lions to touch him. But once a king decrees a thing, it cannot be overturned. So no matter how bad your dilemma gets, there are still rules to God's involvement in your life. And God said, in the earth, let them. Let them, they have dominion in the earth. So now you've got to understand, for to be legal in the earth, you have to have a body. Adam, Eve had bodies, so they now have legal authority in the earth realm. That means whatever will be done in the earth has to be done with man's cooperation. 
I'm going to go over here and preach a little bit. I ain't had an amen over here in about six minutes. Come on. Amen. Amen. Has to be done with man's cooperation. Okay? A lot of people think this is arrogant teaching. Are you making too much of men? Let me tell you. Jesus came down to our level to raise him up to his. Jesus didn't come down to our level to keep us on that level. He came down to raise us up and seat us with him in heavenly places. You don't understand the seat you're occupying is right next to the Lord. So you got to get this picture now. Okay, that was good preaching right there, wasn't it? So, God himself, the Bible says, is two things. Really, three things. The Bible says he's a consuming fire. The Bible says he's love. And the Bible says he's spirit. So God himself is spirit without a body. So he himself, by his own parameters, because the law that God gives is also his own law. When he speaks it, you're not the only one that he wants to abide by. He has to abide by it. And if God said that in the earth man has dominion, then God has to play by what he spoke. He will not violate his own word because the Bible says he's exalted his word above his name. Okay? This is all review from last week. So, God is spirit without a body. That's why the word, we got in heaven the Father, the word, and the flesh. In heaven, his name is not Jesus. His name is the word. The Bible says there are three that testify in heaven. The Father, the word, and the spirit. All right? The word, the second person of the Trinity became flesh. Jesus is his earthly name, not his heavenly name. In heaven, he's known as the Word. The Word became flesh. Why? Because God could do nothing in the earth unless he played by the rules he set up for earth. So God himself, if he was going to refix man, had to become one. That's powerful. God himself, if he hadn't have made that rule, then God could have said, be saved. But he had already said, no man has dominion. So God had to become man in the form of Jesus and take the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from the enemy and regain dominion. And then he turned back to man and said, I'm going, you occupy until I get back. In other words, you take the power I gave you and you occupy the earth with my power and my dominion till I return. In other words, we are not to be scared and trying to run from hell. Hell needs to be scared of me and trying to figure out what it's going to do with me. God wanted the kingdom to be on a forceful advance, not in a place of hiding behind stained glass windows, but moving and taking and overthrowing. Ah, so folks, you got to understand, we are not just here to talk about the kingdom. We are here to impose the kingdom of God into the earth realm. Oh, don't make me go there. I'll break a sweat if I start talking about that. Y'all still with me? I'm enjoying myself. (laughs) Now, so, if God has set up these parameters, that this only legal activity can go with man's permission, God himself had to become a man to do anything about it, then what we understand is that when we pray, God set up prayer as, as a way to invite and give permission to God's activity into the affairs of men. Okay. And then I ended with this question, and it's going to be as silent now as it was last week. Could it be then that nothing is done by God in the earth unless it's an answer to a prayer? So we go to James, and James says, it ain't happening because you ain't praying. He said, and do you not know that the spirit yearns jealously? What does the King James say? Anybody got King James? Lust to to envy? Think King James says, lust to envy. Says the spirit lusteth to envy. Do you know what that means? That means the spirit is on the inside of you, envying the fact you are trying to do his job. Okay. Prayer night should not be the least attended night. We can get folk here for just about anything. 
We really can. We're blessed. But prayer. But now I'm teaching that everything happens in the earth is an answer to prayer. But I can't get people to pray. But the Spirit the whole time is saying, you have no idea all I want to do. But nobody will pray. And so I have not been given permission to move. Because I need earth's cooperation for heaven to act. Why? Because God set the rules off in Genesis 1. Let them. Let them. Now, Acts chapter 12. I got 10 minutes. Don't, don't think I'm already through. I got 10 minutes. Is this all right? Acts chapter 12. Some of y'all didn't say amen all night. Let me hear y'all say amen. Let me, okay, okay. All right. <clears throat> Acts chapter 12. I love to teach this book now. I love to teach this word. <clears throat> I'll try to preach this as fast as I can. <clears throat> this is y'all's third sermon tonight. Please, neighbor, say, you always get your tithe worth here. You always get your tithe worth. Peter was therefore, verse 5, Acts 12, kept in prison. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Somebody say constant. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping. In the morning, his head will be separated from his shoulders and the dude snoring. Now, you're not reading a story tale. Herod is about to get him out of prison, put him under the guillotine and separate his head from his torso. And this guy's sleeping. I like this book. Hallelujah. Peter sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, quickly! And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. So he did and said to him, Put on your garment, <coughs> pardon me, and follow me. So he went out, followed him, and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which, which opened to them on its own accord. And they went out and went down the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Whew. And when Peter had come to himself... He said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent the angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. He came to the house where the church folk were praying for him. I like this place. Okay, And Peter knocked at the, gate, at the door of the gate and a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she didn't even open the gate. But ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you crazy. Yet she kept insisting so. So they said, it's an angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. Now give me just a minute here to work this thing. Before I talk about the folk praying, let me talk about Peter. You can't fight all the time. That's why I told my father when he got the report, I said, rest. I said, I got you. He started weeping when I told him that. Why? At the release of having to carry that burden by himself. To hear somebody else say, you just going home, I got you. That's a good feeling when you got somebody that'll look at you and say, I got you covered. 
I've been praying for you. I tell you what, go ahead and take your old wife on out to eat. Get you a hot dog. Eat that hot dog by candlelight. Look at her and tell you how much you love her. And the next thing y'all going to do when this is over with, go ahead and start talking about it. I've got you covered. Peter is asleep and snoring. Why? You can't fight all the time. And there comes a time where you've bound everything you can bind and you've loosed everything you can loose. You've fasted, you've praised, you've prayed, you've worshipped, you've put on CDs, you've taken off CDs, you've sowed seed, you've given offerings, you've watched TBN, you came to church, you did everything you know to do. Sometime you have to quit doing and rest in what you've already done. I'm serious. That's not permission to be slothful. It's not permission to be lazy. But God knows you can't fight 24 hours a day. And sometimes you've got to rest in the fact I've already fought. This victory's already won. And I'm not hoping, but I'm waiting. Now, secondly, the thing that I want to point out, and I ain't got about four minutes to do it, Is the room that's praying, good. there ain't nothing happening. You've got to quit thinking that if you're in prayer, God owes you a couple of slain in the spirits. You got to quit, you got to quit thinking God owes you a glory cloud. God owes you a how about you? Oh shoot. God does not owe it to you to make the room spooky just to keep you motivated. I'm preaching. I am preaching. Because then you got to check your motive for why you're praying. Are you praying for the brother who you said, I got you? Or you want God to respect the fact that you're praying and he owes you glory and he owes you a shout and he owes you a buck and he owes you a slain? Let me help some of our other leaders in the church out. Quit coming to ministry meetings wanting everybody to turn their attention towards your needs. Go ahead and walk that off, son, my leader. Y'all just need to walk that one off. It's sometimes in giving you'll get. Maybe if you prayed for somebody else's marriage, God might heal yours. Instead of making everybody in the room pray for you. I got a feeling I ain't going to be through at 8.30. The room that's praying is not seeing any manifestation. But in another room, Angels are descending. Chains are falling off. Doors are opening. Prison guards are going blind and being slain. Fact of the matter is, you don't stop praying because there's nothing going on in the room where you're praying. You have no idea what's going on somewhere else because of what you're doing. This room is praying, but this room is being affected. And you ain't seeing your son come home, and you ain't getting a phone call, but in another hotel room somewhere, he's shooting it in his arm, but there ain't nothing happening. And conviction is coming on him. And all of a sudden, the alcohol is making him sick. You don't know what's happening. You're praying for your husband, and you don't feel no anointing, but there's another room where the anointing is moving in and out of that room. And you're not feeling like you're slain in the spirit, but somebody else is getting up out of a wheelchair and saying, I don't know who, but somebody's praying for me. Ah! Turn to three people and say, I got you, I got you, I got you. Just because it ain't happening in
in your room don't mean it ain't happening anywhere. If you're praying here, there's something happening somewhere. Woo! God Almighty, I feel this thing. <laughs> now this is this is my last point oh, sorry for what time it is y'all started late <laughs> now you got to follow what God tells you because now you got sometime you, the entire prescription for you is not described out in the Word. The Word has given you the broad parameters. Then you move into the leading of the Holy Spirit. I can't find nowhere in the Bible where God said, Ron Carpenter, on July 11th, so $2,500 to Benny Hinn Ministries. That ain't in there. I know the parameters of the Word, but now I have gone into God tell me exactly what you would have me to do. Okay? We Pentecostals, okay, for the most part, if we get motivated, we have a good cause and we get together. Most Pentecostal folk can do some praying. Most of them can. I haven't been in many Pentecostal rooms that couldn't get to praying if they needed to pray. Okay. But when I got through with everything God told me to do, I rested in it. Okay? I rested in it. I rested in the fact that I obeyed every single thing God told me to do. What am I saying? Sometimes we praying and we hollering and we... Oh, and you, you're making so much noise, you don't hear the knock. Because whenever God is answering the prayer, there will be a knock in the middle of the noise. And these people are making so much Pentecostal noise that they never heard the knock. That, hey... The prayer has been answered. Now let me move on to a, another point right here. I knew that was my last one, but this is really my last one. And another point. There will always be a time where you've got to quit the praying and then go open the door. You prayed for a door. Now quit praying and go open it. I'm not getting near the amens I was 60 seconds ago. That's good preaching, ain't it, Brother Tony? That's good. Okay? When you pray, opportunity will present itself by the hand of God. Okay? Stop praying and go open the door God brought into your life. Don't continue making so much noise you never miss the knock. And then check your expectation. Because what they were praying for, when they got it, they didn't believe it. Yeah. And for, let me tell you something, Christian folk are funny about that. They were in there praying for Peter to be released from prison. When Peter was released from prison, they said, girl, you crazy. See, the same people that were praying for you will try to talk you out of what they were praying for. I got a shout on that one. Are you praying with expectation? They're praying for Peter. Peter shows up. They don't even open the door. They had to be 
they had to be convinced that God had actually done what they were having an all-night prayer meeting for. When you pray, the end result is not just the fact that you prayed. You are praying with a goal, a result, an impact, an effect in mind. The prayer is not completed just because you finished praying. It's completed when you got the desired result that took you before the Lord in the first place. <laughs> if I could have them. I didn't use my dry erase board, so I apologize. I'm going to let folk go tonight. There's some other folk in here you need healing. And we're going to stay here. We're going to have some worship. And we're going to minister. If I could have elders and those help me, I'm going to be in the altars too. And if I could have all that could help me out, I believe that something is going to be released tonight. Don't ask how. Don't start trying to figure God out. You know, you know, all this and that. No, just believe. Just believe. The only thing God ever told people to do, He said, do you believe? Just, they said, just believe. That's all you got to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I could have you stand on your feet with me, please. <clears throat> Those of you that need to go and it's time to go, please feel free. No guilt. No condemnation. You are free to go. This has been a wonderful night and I am grateful you came. Take what I've taught you and put it to work. Those of you, okay, that need a healing in your body, I'm believing that this is the beginning of a real healing anointing is going to be released in this church. And I want you to feel free to come down here in the quietness of this worship and seek God about that dilemma, that healing, that pain that's in your body. Okay? After this prayer, those of you that need to be dismissed reverently and quietly, you're free to go. Those of you that need to come forward, feel free to. There might be a little bit of congestion in the aisle. But please don't, you know, don't break the flow of the Spirit in the house. Don't get agitated. Don't get aggravated. Be courteous to one another. Lead each other by because we're going to have some coming and some going. Father, in the name of Jesus, I love these people. They're the apple of my eye. They're dear to my heart. I thank you for what you're doing in this house. I thank you for what you're doing in their life. Help everybody in here to stop because there's a knock in the noise. And let us be quiet long enough to go and open the door. Hallelujah. I feel like that's a word tonight, God. In Jesus' name. So, Lord, I'm asking that as those leave tonight, I thank you that they leave in the peace and the promises of God. Those that are about to come forward, I thank you that something powerful happens in the bodies, the emotions, the minds, the hearts of everyone who comes forward. Every one of these elders and altar workers, I thank you that there is a healing anointing in their hand and on their life. God, you don't owe it to us to be spooky. We don't care if anybody hollers, get slain, or if the lights blink, or if we hear lightning. We don't care. All we want is for you to do what you said you would do. And that's that you would heal us by your stripes. And I thank you that there's power in this house tonight. And everybody said amen together. Hallelujah. Those that need to come forward, feel free. Those that are being dismissed, feel free to do so. Hallelujah. Come on, Pastor Steve. Let's worship God. Let's worship God. Come on, praise team.
you leave before somebody's prayed for you.